Cool. Well, thanks for making it out uh, early this morning. It's been a crazy week uh, full of in, uh, intense activities, a lot of crazy parties and uh, fantastic conversations. Uh, yeah, I'm Jared. I'm uh, co-founder of Status. Um, it's, uh, but really, I'm really just a representative of like 100 plus core contributors that are all participating in uh, this project, trying to will it into existence. Um, and I'm pretty much just a cat herder these days. Um, I wanted to start off this talk with a, with a quote uh, from Marshall McLuhan. Uh, we shape our tools, and therefore, uh, our tools shape us. Um, I've kind of known about this for a while and certainly heard of it, but I don't think I really understood it until kind of recently when I started working with sort of larger scale uh, human systems. Um, a lot of the time we talk about like changes that we do to software and things that we're updating, uh, but we don't really think about how we actually change ourselves in doing these things. Uh, and we're in an industry that has, is primed and uh, can potentially impact uh, millions of people, if not the whole globe. So the design decisions we make uh, today uh, could have everlasting consequences, and it's really important to keep this stuff in mind. And Status really starts off with a, a question that we're trying to answer, and is could we actually build a secure communication tool that upholds human rights while enabling community money, community law, and through privacy, help preserve culture? And when in answering these things, uh, you can't help to start feel more principled. Uh, you can't help to think about public programmable blockchains and connecting directly to them to avoid intermediaries, because immediately, if you allow that into it, uh, you, you create an, an environment where there can be um, corruption and these sort of adversarial attacks. So we initially started uh, embedding Go Ethereum in, in directly uh, on your phone. Um, we still do today, um, but it, we also started thinking about what it actually means to create a generalized um, interface to Ethereum. Um, I think the ideal version of that, we're still a little bit short from. Um, ideally, it would look like a window manager or a desktop environment or directly uh, integrated into the operating system. Um, but while we're in this mobile form factor, uh, it's currently expressed as essentially three apps all rolled into one. Uh, we have this DAP browser, which is essentially like your window manager. It allows you to access all these crazy cool DAPs that are coming out on top of Ethereum. Uh, you have your wallet or your transaction management. Uh, this allows you to sign transactions, manage your assets, uh, blah, 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 oh, and get your collectibles, of course. Um, and the other part that is sometimes a little uh, perplexing to people is chat. Um, but if you think of the term smart contracts, and I know there's uh, some uh, opinions against that, uh, but it's really, really interesting to think about the implications of, of what we're doing. Uh, if we are signing smart contracts as people, uh, you can never really sign a contract uh, in the legal sense without first a meeting of the minds. And so we need to create an environment in where we can actually provide uh, secure private access to coordinating before we create uh, transaction artifacts of our human relationships. Uh, we're also targeting Android and iOS, and uh, we've uh, been working on that for some time now. Uh, and that's pretty much where think people think that we, we stop and that's what we work on. Um, quite frankly, uh, our scope has expanded since then. And uh, yeah, this is just a bunch of crazy stuff that we're going through, and I'd love to walk you through some of it. Now, I mentioned this idea of like how our tools shape us. And uh, if you remember about a year and a half ago-ish, uh, most of the crypto communities were doing a lot of the community building over a tool uh, called Slack. Um, unfortunately, Slack was essentially uh, designed without uh, the public in mind. It wasn't exactly like IRC. Um, it didn't have really any moderation tools. And uh, it's basically for sort of internal teams. And this internalness or this castle mentality is, is something that really shook us. Uh, our community grew to over 16,000 people. We had 50 to 100 uh, active people chatting about different things in different chat channels at any given moment of the day. And uh, it, was a, it was a fantastic time for a community-driven project. Uh, the issue with that, of course, is that um, we had a bunch of scammers and fishers who were quite ripe at the time. Uh, they came in, and we didn't really have any tools to help uh, combat or defend that. 
uh, almost every project was forced to essentially uh, split their communities. Some moved into Riot and Matrix, some into Rocket Chat, and others into Telegram, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, which would be fine, uh, but unfortunately for us, we had set up a bunch of uh, uh, bots and different processes uh, that were integrated directly within chat. So it made it very difficult for us to uh, extricate, extri extricate ourselves from that and move into a different environment because the amount of effort to get back to our productivity was, was too high. Um, and what that really did is we started hiring, we started growing the team, and with that, people were coming into this and they were, they were already divorced from the community, this castle mentality starts to infect us. The terms internal versus external became a thing. And it was incredibly uh, depressing, actually, because we were no longer connected with our community, uh, the people that we're actually building with and for. And it's kind of strange because at the end of the day, our application is all about connectedness. So. Last year at DEF CON, we announced Status Desktop uh, to solve this problem. Uh, essentially, we act, uh, we're adding uh, three new pl target platforms, which is Mac, Linux, and uh, Windows. Um, last year, it kind of looked like the, uh, that picture there, the janky, or the janky one. Um, and uh, we didn't want just like an Electron application. Uh, a lot of, we wanted to share our React Native code base uh, amongst all of our platforms. Uh, so we, picked, we dusted off uh, an old project that Canonical started and uh, spruced it up a little bit, optimized it, and uh, been, have been implementing different rendering components that React Native has. And today we finally got to an alpha, uh, which is actually somewhat usable. It has the same code base as the uh, mobile application, uh, but not all the same features are, are created. So as part of this, uh, today, we want to, like to deactivate our Slack entirely as a signal that we are moving our entire organization into Status Desktop. <laughs> Thanks. So, so our boy Nabil is going to make this happen now. That's our CFO, by the way, you know? <laughs> um, anyway, so on a more serious note, so that's done, which is great. So um, you're welcome to join the conversation. Uh, you'll notice that there's hashtag topics. Uh, these are whisper topics, and you're welcome to join it on the mobile application or in desktop. Um, although, you know, be warned, the desktop thing is like really janky. It's more janky than the mobile application. Mobile application. Um, Anyway, so we have uh, the other issue that we've had is we had a bunch of different stories about how much assets people are actually carrying around in their mobile wallets, like on public transportation. And it's a little scary sometimes when you hear these things, um, especially when you hear about some of these news uh, over the past year, how perhaps we can't really trust our hardware devices as much as we would like to think. Um, and certainly a mobile phone is not somewhere you want to be storing your keys. So we've been, uh, last year, we, we mentioned uh, this idea of doing a hardware wallet. Uh, the code base is now completely done, and it's been audited, and we're now moving, uh, we found a great card platform, and we're moving into production. Uh, that's some prototype uh, packaging there. Um, and essentially, what this allows you to do is put your HD keys on a credit card form factor um, and just tap on your phone to, to log in. Uh, it, it allows you to have pins, it allows you to export your whisper identity, uh, and we have an extra feature if you're feeling especially dangerous uh, for tap and pay, which is essentially pinless. Uh, so you can imagine later on that it's, uh, you could add a point of sales terminal, it's kind of like you just tap the amount of cash that you're willing to risk um, for ease of transactions. Um, but this is also really fascinating from an onboarding standpoint. You can imagine these things wrapped in foil, uh, preloaded with a, a certain amount of tokens um, in a convenience store. 
and the person would have everything they needed to get going uh, in, in Ethereum. They would tap their, the, the card against their phone, it would automatically load up um, the installation for status. At the same time, uh, it'll allow you to retrieve the preloaded um, tokens from it, uh, and then you'd be able to initialize it correctly with, uh, with the hardware wallet. Um, so that's going really well. Uh, we also started working on the next uh, version of this, uh, where we want to essentially create a, the same credit card form factor, but have things like Bluetooth and all that involved. But we want the hardware to be actually open. So uh, it's very hard to find these kinds of platforms and asking them to open source their PCP designs. Uh, another major thing that we do uh, is uh, user, user research. Uh, we have a team that actually travels globally in uh, meeting with people who are not involved in the blockchain space whatsoever. And we do a lot of testing with them. Uh, and essentially, this is uh, allowing the public or the people to help mold our tools and make it a lot easier to use. Um, one of the most interesting things for, for UX is that some of, the, some of the security features or the ways that you have to do things in, in Ethereum are a little uh, unorthodox. And uh, for example, if you've signed a transaction in status, um, you will see this thing called a signing phrase. And it's essentially an anti-phishing measure. Um, and it's the first time that, that users are actually required to have the application prove its identity to you. It's usually the other way around. Um, but of course, the signing phrase, it's, at the moment, it's, it's a jumble of three words. And that's a little bit confusing, especially when you have uh, your passphrase already. Um, what we found through our testing is that the use of emojis has been incredibly powerful. Uh, it gives you a sense of like warmness when you, uh, when you sign, and it makes you feel a lot better, and you're much more inclined to sign transactions, which is kind of interesting. Um, We've also done many uh, iterations over our onboarding, uh, apart from like the password stuff, uh, which we'll like, replace with fingerprints very soon. Um, it's pretty smooth, everyone's pretty happy with uh, getting through, and there's very little attrition in what we're doing at the moment. Um, however, uh, once you get in, it's, like a, it's basically you might as well see a little hay bale kind of rolling along, whatever it's called. Um, and that's because we're not connecting you with the community. We need to find ways that we can actually uh, bring you to other people so you can start participating in a wonderful community online. Um, and we have some interesting ideas about that. Uh, you could imagine uh, subscribing to uh, uh, new user notifications, and when a new user comes on, you get a notification to go chat with them, and uh, you all come into a group chat and uh, give them the rundown, help them, help them out, and get them started within, within this crypto space. Um, We've also done a lot of surveying in terms of like what our requirements are uh, for actually uh, getting adoption of status. Um, and ubiquity is the main thing. So we, we need to be everywhere for every reason. So, uh, and of course, security is in, uh, paramount. Another thing we've reintroduced is extensions. Uh, this is something that we had a while back, um, but it was a pretty janky implementation. It's a lot better now, and it's incredibly powerful. Uh, essentially, we'll want to get to other people to kind of build on top of status and build within the chat UI. Um, and we'll have other hooks for other parts of the application in, in the future. Uh, some of the in-house uh, extension ideas we're, we've been looking at is doing multi-sig transactions within the chat context. Uh, we're thinking about doing stenographic messages so you can actually send hidden messages even though they're already encrypted and then decrypt them on your side, uh, as well as things like self-destructing messages. Uh, we also uh, released our ENS names, so you no longer have to have a ridiculous long address. Uh, you can just be referenced by, by your name. Um, for example, you could, uh, you could register potatoes, and then people can just find you by potatoes. Um, and yeah, it's really cool. Uh, it's, but I, I'm a little bit concerned about this, actually, because th there's some, there's some, there are potentially some issues, uh, depending on how this technology goes. Uh, we might be creating a problem where people can be identified, depending on like uh, some of the virtual asset regulation stuff that's coming out. So, yeah, keep an eye on it. 
Um, another thing we've integrated uh, is a voting DAP. It uh, uses quadratic voting, and of course, it's non-binding. Um, but essentially, we're trying, uh, you can think of it as trying to get community feedback and help us influence the direction of it, even if you don't really want to contribute in any other way. Uh, in fact, the reason why I mentioned potatoes is because our community voted for me saying potatoes, um, which is great. Um, we also have this thing called a wall of shame, which I'll talk a bit later, or it's called Book of Shame and Opportunities now, I think. Um, and we basically, together, uh, during our offsite earlier this week, we came up with a list of all our priorities and we all voted on what we think is going to be the, the best way forward. Uh, this is not in our nightly, it's not in our release, but we are currently reintroducing private group chats. Uh, we tore it all down, um, and that's predominantly because we use uh, Whisper's identity-based encryption uh, only, and that's something like PGP. Uh, but we want to include another layer of encryption by default, which is perfect forward secrecy. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's what we're doing. Um, that's some slides of what group chat looks like at the moment. And uh, PFS is, is something that we're doing. But the important thing with this is that we're actually making this by default and adding it into your contact requests. Um, pretty much every other messenger out there does not make this by default. Uh, and if they do, then um, they include your phone, like you have to register with your phone number, which is problematic and for a different reason. So we do a lot of work on, on the, the UI and the app and how we can actually interface humans with blockchain technology. Um, but we're getting to the point now where we've pretty much kind of come to the limits in terms of what the light client protocol is capable of doing and what Whisper is capable of doing. Uh, in fact, this whole uh, event has been a, a really good live test run for us to see how well Whisper scales. Uh, we've implemented some of the Bloom filter stuff and we've managed to kind of bring down our network topology quite a bit. So on a daily usage, it's just not using a one gigabyte worth of bandwidth, uh, it's using roughly 12 to 20 megabytes. Um, however, when there's concurrent users and there's a lot of network um, and network activity, uh, it does become problematic. So we need to start thinking beyond this and how we can actually start moving down into that space uh, and help working with researchers to, to make better protocols. Um, and the same with the light client protocol. Um, I think when we move off proof of work and move into a proof of uh, stake scheme, this would be quite interesting. Um, but for, for now, we need to start thinking about ultralight clients, ways that the client uh, can get a, a level of security and pull down state, uh, but not necessarily have to verify the blocks themselves. And in running with that theme, uh, we've also started working on a Ethereum 2.0 uh, sharding client called Nimbus, uh, basically taking a lot of our engineering ideas in terms of getting this stuff running on resource-restricted devices, such as mobile phones, Raspberry Pis, routers, that sort of thing. Um, and we really want to create like a, a really good um, solution for, for that and hopefully expand that out to include some layer two stuff as well. Uh, we're also trying to do our best to support the community in terms of education and development. Uh, one thing that we've had to do is bring lots of uh, skills from outside the space that we haven't been able to source. And uh, there is just uh, this disparity. So we need to create these training systems uh, to be able to help people understand this technology and build dApps and that sort of thing. Uh, and of course, development is something that we've been involved in for a while. Uh, we've been contributing to Viper for, for eons now, it feels like. Um, and we are now building out the Embark team, and they've been doing some amazing stuff. I hope you checked out Yuri's um, talk. It was, it was really good. And their uh, web ID is absolutely insane. They have blockchain explorers and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but we're also uh, taking Embark further and making a status studio. This will essentially be, at least in its current form, a, a series of Visual Studio uh, code plugins, as well as an education portal. And we'll be going beyond just DAP development. We'll be talking about libertarian principles uh, and uh, how to design these things, et cetera, et cetera. So I basically just rattled off like a bunch of like stuff that we're doing, um, but they're pretty much all, uh, how I view software is they're essentially cultural artifacts. They're material items that have taken our mental models and we've put them into things. Um, and now we've gotten to this point where we, we can actually stop for a moment, look up, and really think about the future. And when we start thinking about the future, we start thinking about how do we actually want to go about doing this? Do we really want to live in this castle that was Slack? Um, 
and who are we actually designing this stuff for? So we got together in uh, Basel in Switzerland uh, to really understand like, what we're actually about and what we actually believe, what are our values. Uh, and these principles in terms of software design uh, is really where it came down to. Uh, we're, thinking, we're talking about liberty, uh, censorship resistance, security, privacy, transparency, openness, decentralization, inclusivity, uh, continuous and resourcefulness. Um, keep in mind the uh, inclusivity and uh, continuance stuff, because I'll talk about it in a moment. But the rest of the other principles uh, made us really understand that there's a bunch of work that we have to do. Um, I mentioned this idea of this uh, book of shame and opportunity, and it made us really understand the, th the threat model that exists out there in terms of protecting people's assets and uh, the, basically the livelihood. And uh, I mean, this quote is, is pretty extreme, um, but it has been said and ushered. And um, even though I'm not uh, one to judge on whether that's justified or not, uh, I think the, the means of what, uh, basically the, the technology that's been created to be able to do that sort of thing uh, has other implications or ability to be misused. Uh, so for example, uh, phone numbers, which is pretty much in every messenger when you sign up, is leaking your metadata. Um, we avoid it now. Uh, we started like doing the uh, sort of phone verification, stripped it all out. Um, mixed panel is quite interesting. Uh, this is really important for product managers to really understand how people are navigating through an application and, and try and refine the user experience. Uh, but the problem is, is that's leaking a lot of data and it's sending it to a centralized server that we no longer control. So we have no idea how that data is being used. Um, so we had to rip it out. Uh, of course, that made a lot of people unhappy uh, because they could no longer do their job effectively in the same way that they could. We're trying to combat this with two things. Uh, basically, we want to go and talk uh, directly with uh, users of the software, within the software. Uh, and we also want to do a thing called adversarial analytics. Uh, basically, we are attacking our own platform to see what data we can get out of it. So we're trying to identify users by their transactions. We're trying to, uh, we've got a cluster of Whisper, of course, so we see what messages we can find from that. Well, we can't see messages, but we can find um, how they're flowing throughout the network. Um, and trying to identify sort of network topologies and seeing if we can find correlations between relationships. Um, we're also think, uh, we also recently removed a thing called test flight. Uh, test flight is basically used by banks and uh, a whole bunch of other applications out there um, for testers to get you know accurate logs and like video screens and stuff like that. Um, now they have a feature, right, where you can hide password screens and you can hide certain screens. So, like, the idea was that we could use this and like hide certain elements. Um, this is only included on in our nightlies, by the way, and not in any releases. <clears throat> but the problem with this is they had a bug twice now where those features stopped working, and it was too much, so we pulled that out as well. Now. The, the how is quite interesting in how we want to do this. Uh, like I've mentioned, uh, we've been kind of living in a castle uh, the past year or so, and it's not really uh, conducive to, to like what this project's really about. And it certainly has become less community-driven uh, than it has been in the, in, before. Um, so now we're thinking about how can we actually move out into the space? How can we get uh, help encourage more people to get involved? And what kind of structure does that look like? And it's quite interesting because there's, like, there's two different kinds of modes of thinking about this. Uh, and a really good example is this uh, spaghetti and marshmallow challenge. Show of hands, who's actually heard of that challenge, by the way? Cool. So basically, um, the idea is, uh, in the study, is they, they have a bunch of kindergartners on one side, and they have a bunch of CEOs or lawyers or any other skilled profession on the other side. Um, and they're given uh, 20 sticks of uh, spaghetti, uh, basically raw spaghetti, and they're given a stack of marshmallows. And they need to make the marshmallow get as high as possible. Um, now, you would think that the, the CEOs and all these high-skilled people would actually start building and getting it as high as possible. But more often than not, uh, the kindergartners do. And it's essentially theorized that the kindergartners uh, don't really need to worry about so, um, 
histories or so, like social pecking orders and that sort of thing. They're just all equal and they all just, just try stuff. You know, they just mash things together, talk awkwardly, and just brute force the problem. Um, which is quite interesting when you start thinking about collective action. So I'm also quite influenced by uh, a political scientist named Mark Bever. Uh, he d has a dissented theory of governance. Um, basically, uh, we're so obsessed with formalisms, or at least we focus on formalisms because they are incredibly important, uh, but they are essentially institutions. Um, his position is essentially that uh, before you even get to that point, these institutions rise out of a narrative, uh, out of our social norms, our traditions, our rituals, and our, which give rise to our belief systems. And so if you're creating uh, essentially a DAO or a model where anyone can fund anything and, and create proposals and get funded, like how do you actually corral that? How do you create direction? Um, how do you create sense of purpose? And his ideas are essentially revolving around cultivating that shared narrative and treating it like a cultural practice. Uh, so you need to find anchor points uh, within this space, which could be our principles. They become talking discussions. Uh, you can treat people as like nodes in a social network, except for the, uh, the software they run is their culture, and the discussions we have is like semi-updating or loosely updating each other. When we started talking about this, and as soon as we had uh, status running, almost immediately a pseudonymous group or faction arose within status. Uh, they have a, a channel called Moot, and they all use the same key. Um, we don't know who they are, but they're basically voicing their opinions uh, on how things should be done that they wouldn't normally do. It's a really fascinating uh, cult cultural experience to, to be part of when uh, people are voicing their concerns uh, or bringing up ideas and moving it completely away uh, from biases of individual. You can really treat ideas in a meritocrat meritocratic way. Um, anyway, so who are we building for? Uh, essentially ourselves to start off with, and when we're talking about that, we're talking about internal motivation. Um, we all come from different life, uh, walks of life. Some of us have more crypto-anarchistic side of things. Uh, some people are actually living in these conditions, and other people just want to help others. Um, and those others are the dispossessed, and eventually we want to do almost everybody. Um, and so we're like also working on uh, cultivating culture. Uh, like I mentioned, and one of the best ways to do that is through symbology and through memes, essentially. Uh, so we're coming up with a framework in terms of our branding that allows people to individualize it. And so it no longer becomes this one static symbol, but it becomes a living object that we can all change and transform. You can imagine in a decade's time what status looks like in terms of a symbology in Indonesia will be drastically different from like North America. And here's some examples of uh, some artists that are already doing that. Uh, we're also questioning what is mass adoption, uh, because that can mean really different things on, uh, for different reasons. Uh, you can imagine that uh, in the developed country, there's not really a real need for a lot of this stuff, because we already have existing legal frameworks. In fact, they're already bleeding into this, uh, this technology already. But there's another side, uh, another me mega trend that's happening uh, is this idea of mass urbanization. There's going to be over 2 billion people uh, forecasted living in slums by 2030, according to UN Habitat. Uh, they live in informal economies, and perhaps we can start uh, reaching them. Anyway, the point is, is status as an organization is changing. We'll be moving into a DAO. Uh, I hope you would join us on the, on the journey and be part of the conversation. Thank you very much.